gold mining in Africa, maximizing economic returns for countries, by Usman Gadrigo, Emeli Mutambatseri, Gorani Ndaye. Working paper number 147, March 2012. Office of the Chief Economist. Osman Gajigo is an economist. Amele Mutembetseri is a principal research economist. And Guarani Njaye is a research economist. The authors are grateful for comments and suggestions from participants at the 4th West and Central African Mining Summit in Accra. We have also benefited from comments from Yanis Arvantis and other colleagues from the research department. The article reflects the opinions of the authors and not those of the African Development Bank, its board of directors, or the countries they represent. Abstract. This paper investigates the maximization of economic returns from mining for African countries. We focus on gold mining, a significant sector in at least 34 African countries. Our point of departure in the paper is the well-documented reality that a large number of resource-rich African countries have benefited little from their resource endowments. This group includes many gold-producing countries. Part of the reason for this state of affairs is the fact that countries have received smaller shares of the rents generated from the sector. Furthermore, those shares have not always been efficiently utilized. We carry out some analysis to provide evidence showing that royalty rates, a major source of revenues from the gold mining sector in the region, can be increased to enable countries to better profit from the sector while allowing firms to realize reasonable returns on their investments. The paper also provides some policy recommendations to not only increase regional countries' share of the resource rent from mining, but also to ensure that the revenues received are better allocated. Introduction how to ensure that mineral resource wealth contributes to sustainable economic development has been a perennial topic concerning many African countries. It is an especially pressing issue in countries that are rich in resources but perform poorly on a host of development indicators. Too many countries export resources, often through multinational firms, while the citizens enjoy little of the resource endowment. This occurs mainly due to unfair concession agreements and or the mismanagement of the resources revenues. This paper focuses on the gold mining sector and how to ensure that the sector better contributes to development. Development Finance Institutions DFIs, including the African Development Bank AFDB, have important roles to play in reducing the resource curse phenomenon in Africa. Specifically, as multilateral institutions that engage government as development partners and serve as financiers to some private sector projects, the AFDB and other DFIs are in a unique position to ensure both that concession agreements in the mining sector are fair to governments and that the revenues received from those concessions are allocated to proper expenditures. This paper analyzes the gold mining sector in Africa with an emphasis on policy reforms that enable regional countries to better benefit from the sector. We provide some background on why the sector's contribution to development has been limited. A key factor is the prevalence of unfair concession agreements which severely limit the share of resource rent that remains within countries. We pay particular attention to royalty rates, which bring in one of the largest shares of government revenues from the taxation of the gold mining sector in African countries. We also perform some analysis of data from gold mines to examine whether the current royalties increase the cost of production to the extent of affecting mine profitability 
or decreasing the likelihood of investment in the sector in African region. Our analysis shows that royalties as a share of production costs are small in Africa. Other factors such as mine grade note the grade of a gold mine is a measure of the richness of the ore. It measures the amount of gold in grams per ton of ore extracted. The higher the grade, the richer the mine in gold, and consequently the lower the cost of production per unit of gold extracted. It varies significantly between mines and also over time within the same mine. End note. Have a much more significant effect on cost and profitability. In fact, the level of royalty rates that would significantly reduce profit per ounce of gold produced is far above the prevailing rates in most gold producing African countries. The result of our analysis actually suggests that there is a case for increasing royalties above the current modal rate of 3% to enable countries to gain a higher share of the mineral revenues. Ensuring that governments receive a larger share of the mineral rent is a necessary but not sufficient condition for the gold mining sector to contribute positively to development in the region. Without good governance, the resource revenues are unlikely to be spent appropriately, even if a higher share of the rent somehow manages to accrue to governments. This paper therefore discusses a selected number of policy reforms to ensure that countries not only receive a fair share of the resource rents generated from the gold mining sector through greater transparency, but to increase the likelihood that they would be properly allocated to development enhancing expenditures. The rest of the paper proceeds as follows. The next section provides a background on the gold mining industry by highlighting the leading producers, the demand for gold and historical price movements. Section 3 reviews the literature on resource curse and provides a comparison of the economic performance between resource rich and non-resource rich countries. Section 4 provides a summary of the mining codes and fiscal regimes of the major gold producing countries in Africa, identifying the major revenue instruments such as royalty, corporate income tax, and equity shares. Section 5 includes recommendations on how countries can increase their shares of the rents and bring greater transparency to better manage revenues. This section also includes analysis to further examine the effect of royalties on gold mining in Africa. Section 6 concludes the paper. 2. Background on the gold sector 2.1. Production The global average annual production of gold over the past five years is approximately 2,400 metric tons MT. African countries account for 20% of that volume 480 metric tons. The continent's largest producer is South Africa averaging close to 250 metric tons per annum, slightly over half of the continent's production and about 10% of global production. In fact, it is the only African country featuring among the top 10 gold producers in the world. The other key gold producing African countries are Ghana, Mali, Tanzania, and Guyana. In total, there are at least 34 African countries producing gold, though only about 20 countries so far have been producing more than a ton per annum. U.S. Geological Survey 2011 Note: It is worth noting that the ranking of gold producers in Africa is not the same as the countries with the largest gold deposits. Precise geological information on gold deposit is hard to come by for African countries given the limited number of explanation. Sturmer 2010 End note. 
the leading gold producers in the world in order are China, United States, Australia, South Africa, and Russia. In addition to gold that comes from mines, an additional 1,500 metric tons of annual global output on average comes from recycling. World Gold Council, 2011 Gold production by continent between 2005 and 2009 is presented in Figure 2. Africa's production is slightly ahead of Europe but far behind the Americas and Asia, including Australasia. The region's production is relatively constant over this period. 2.2 Demand There are three broad categories of gold demand, industry, investment, and jewelry. The relative shares between 2008 and 2010 are presented in Figure 3. Jewelry constitutes the highest proportion of gold use, 53%. Industry use accounts for 12%, and approximately 35% is used as a safe investment during periods of high inflation or when the real rate of return on other investment vehicles is low. The two most important countries driving the demand for gold are India and China and together they account for half of the gold consumed in the past two years. India's demand is driven mostly by jewelry while China's is more equally driven by the above mentioned three categories. 2.3 Price The current price of gold is at an almost unprecedented high figures 4 and 5. In fact the average price in 2011 is lower than only the price attained in 1980 in real terms. Like most commodity prices, gold price experiences significant fluctuations. And as with all traded commodities, the price is determined by supply and demand. Shifts in supply arise mainly from new gold deposits in the various mines across the world. A major and fluctuating factor in demand for gold is the need for safe investment. This means that the demand for gold tend to increase when the real rate of return on alternative investments falls. This usually occurs in periods when either the yield on benchmark securities, for example the US Treasury bonds or bill, falls significantly or when there are expectations of higher inflation. For example, the high gold prices of the 1970s and early 1980s, figure 4, coincided with one of the highest global inflation period. During such periods, smaller shares of gold tend to be put to end uses such as jewelry and industry. 2.4 Players in the Gold Mining Industry 2.41 Large Scale Mining Modern gold mining is very capital intensive and as a result the firms in the industry are large on average. The largest gold mining companies in the world are not that far apart in their levels of production. Barrick Gold is the largest and accounts for about 8% of the world production. Newmont 6%, Anglo Gold Ashanti 5%, Gold Fields 4%, Gold Corp, 3%, and Ken Ross, 3%, round out the top six in terms of production. With the exception of Gold Corp, all these firms have operational mines in Africa with highly varying volumes of production. Anglo Gold, a South African based firm, has the largest volume of its production based in Africa, 73% of its production. Goldfields, another South African based firm, attributes 73% of its production to mines in Africa. On the other hand, only about 7% of Barrick's gold production comes from Africa, mainly from its mines in Tanzania. It is worth noting that the African based firms that feature among these top producers operate mines in other world regions as well. 
While large scale producers are sometimes involved in all stages of the operations, they are most visible in the post exploration phases. Box 1 Box 1 Stages of a Modern Mining Operation Most mining operations go through five key stages 1. Exploration, 2. Feasibility, 3. Construction. 4 operation and 5 closure. The exploration phase involves the basic process of determining if sufficient minerals exist in a given area. A lot of exploration is carried out by small mining companies, juniors, who do not always have operating mines. A government issued license is required for exploration and average duration of such a license is 3 years renewable in Africa. The next step involves the engineering and financial process of determining if the extraction of the discovered mineral is commercially viable. If the feasibility study is detailed enough it becomes a bankable feasibility study where it shows whether the project could be financed through a contribution of equity and debt this document is usually required before a company is granted a mining license. Construction can only commence if the mining license, the average is 23 years in Africa and it is renewable for all African countries, is granted through negotiations with the government. Depending on the scale of the mine, this process can take anywhere from two to three years. The mineral is obtained during the mining or production phase, the length of which depends on the life of the mine. This is highly variable and is a function of the grade of the mine and commodity price among other variables. Most gold mines in Africa are open cast instead of underground and this is mainly determined by how far underground the mineral is located. After the production ends, mine closure and reclamation takes place. This is an important stage in gold mining since production involves the use of a lot of hazardous chemicals such as cyanide. 2.42 Small Scale Mining While gold production nowadays is dominated by multinational companies, this has not always been the case in many African countries. Small-scale mining operations that are often unregistered and sometimes illegal have accounted for a significant amount of gold production in Africa before reforms led to the entrance of large multinational companies. World Bank 1992 In Burkina Faso, for example, small-scale artisanal miners produced approximately 12 tons of gold compared to an output of 14 tons from large-scale mines between 1986 and 1997 Guay, 2001. In many regional countries the relative volume of gold production by artisanal miners has gone down as production by multinational firms has increased. Accurate statistics are difficult to obtain due to the fact that the operations of many artisanal miners are not registered. Note, this also makes it difficult to estimate the amount of tax revenue foregone by not taxing these artisanal miners. End note. 3. The Contribution of Mining to Development in Africa The performance of non-agricultural commodity exporting countries in Africa has not been impressive despite their valuable resource endowments. The economic literature on this so-called resource curse phenomenon is vast Saxon Warner 2001 but has not drawn unanimous conclusions both on the extent of the relationship between growth and resource endowment and the underlying causal factors the divergence in conclusions is explained partly by the differences in the nature and scope of the various studies for example while some studies have been case study based others have employed Econometric methods apply to cross-sectional data covering several countries. 
Two of the major studies in this area are Deaton and Miller, 1995, and Raditz, 2007, which both found a positive relationship between commodity prices and GDP growth in a cross-section of African countries. Other recent studies have found a more nuanced set of findings. Collier and Gauderis, 2009, estimated the effect of commodity prices on growth and exports. They found that increases in commodity prices have a generally positive effect on growth and exports in the short run. However, long-term effects differ depending on a country's governance measures. The long-run effect of commodity prices is positively significant for good governance countries while negatively significant for bad governance countries. The preceding brief review naturally leads to the question of the causal relationship between resource abundance and economic performance. The literature points to two possible explanations of the resource curse, namely the Dutch disease effect. Note. A phenomenon associated with a country's discovery of tradable natural resources, such as oil, whereby a real appreciation of its exchange rate is experienced as a result of large foreign currency inflows from natural resource exports, leading to the crowding out of its other tradable sectors. End note. And rent seeking. Note, rent seeking occurs when individuals or firms compete for economic rents that arise when government restrictions are imposed upon economic activity. Rent seeking behavior can take many forms and in some cases the activity itself can be legal. In resource rich countries, particularly those with weak institutions, rent seeking behavior can take a particularly destructive form both as a reason for civil conflict and a source of funds that further fuels such conflicts. Collier and Hoffler, 2005, and Hartler, 2006. End of note. These two mechanisms are not mutually exclusive. The country's capacity to prevent adverse real exchange rate appreciation from natural resources revenues is often a function of its governance or institutional quality, which are also key determinants of rent-seeking behavior. In other words, the variance of economic growth across similarly resource-rich countries suggests that institutional quality, which plays a significant part in determining how those resources' revenues are used, has a strong bearing on growth effects. This view is now well accepted in the literature Bolte et al. 2005, Collier and Hoffler 2005, Deacon and Mueller 2006, Kostad and Soray 2009, Melhem et al. 2006. 3.1 Growth Trends for Resource Rich African Countries. The stylized facts discussed above depend to a large extent on evidence from Africa, Saxon Warner 2001. These facts are also supported by the growth trends observed for Africa's natural resource rich countries especially over the period 1980 to 2000. GDP growth rates of resource rich African countries over this period fell below the continent's average growth rate, figure 7. The growth performance of resources endowed countries, however, has somewhat changed course past 2000, benefiting from a commodity price boom and possibly better governance. On average, resource-rich countries, which include some gold producers, have performed better than other African countries in terms of GDP growth over the past decade. Figure 7 Brixiova and Endu Kumana, 2011. Note, 
We define gold producers as those countries with an average annual gold production of at least 100 kg. However, GDP per capita growth alone is not a sufficient measure of economic development. We also examine how well-resourced endowed countries have performed historically on the basis of broad-based measures of economic performance. Using the Human Development Index HDI, as a metric for development, Figure 8 shows that resource-rich countries with above-median governance have performed better than other countries in Africa over the past three decades. On the contrary, resource-rich countries with weak governance have performed worse. However, the performance of both groups appears to have improved over time on the basis of the HDI. Gold producing Africa countries, some of which are also classified as resource rich, follow similar broad trends with regards to GDP per capita growth, figure 9. On the basis of the HDI, gold producers trail behind resource rich countries, possibly reflecting the fact that rents generated from resources such as oil are generally much higher than those accruing from gold production. In fact, only three of the 11 gold producing countries with above median governance measures are middle income countries, while five of the nine resource rich countries with below median governance are classified as such. As a result, growth trends in gold producing countries are less significantly driven by gold mineral rents. Gold producers also exhibit below average human development performance relative to other African countries regardless of governance levels. Figure 10. This reflects the large number of gold producing countries with both weak governance structures and low per capita incomes. Note countries such as Eritrea, Niger, and Burundi fall into this category. And note. A close look at the mining sector in Africa, especially gold mining, provides some indications as to why the sector has underperformed on its broad-based development effects relative to GDP growth. First, most gold mines in Africa are economic enclaves, having limited linkages with the rest of the economy. This problem is reinforced by the fact that modern mining is highly capital intensive. Second, mining operations in Africa are characterized by a high prevalence of concession agreements that are unfair in terms of distribution of economic rents to African governments. 3.2 Limited Linkages Backward linkages with other sectors of the economy are created when the activity concerned creates a demand for local goods and services. In the case of gold mining, this could include local contractors for associated infrastructure components or manufacturers of materials such as explosives, chemicals and fuel, and providers of services including transportation, legal and financial services. For most gold producing African countries, few of these goods and services are sourced locally. For example, adequate machinery and equipment are prerequisites in the capital intensive gold mining industry and almost all of these are imported except for operations in South Africa. Consumables such as fuel, explosives and chemicals, cyanide, mercury, ammonium nitrate etc. are also usually imported. This means that almost all hardware is imported and only a few non-tradable services are sourced locally. Employment generation is very limited due to the capital intensive nature of the sector. For example, despite its heavy share in the economy, 17% of GDP and 70% of exports, mining directly employs only about 13,000 people, about 1% of the formal sector employees in Mali. 
Thomas 2010. In Ghana, the sector employed a similar number of people between 2000 and 2007, representing 0.2% of the non-agricultural labor force. Ghana Chamber of Mines 2011. This is despite the fact that mining accounts for 5.5% of Ghana's GDP and 40% of its exports. Ayi et al. 2011. Forward linkages with other sectors within local economy are created when the use or the processing of the extracted minerals generate further economic activities. The potential for this to occur depends significantly on the level of benefication of the mineral. With the exception of South Africa, where part of the gold produced is processed locally, the refining of gold mined in Africa occurs abroad. Gold mining does not produce byproducts that could be used by local industries. In the absence of benefication, there are almost no forward linkages for the local economies from gold mining. In the end, the total value of goods and services sourced locally is generally small. Indirect effects are equally constrained by the capital intensive nature of the industry and its limited linkages. 3.3 Fairness of Mining Deals in Africa Most gold mines in Africa are majority owned by foreign multinational companies. As a result, the main avenues through which African countries benefit from the mineral reserves is through government tax revenues. The effectiveness of this mechanism depends in turn on the fairness of mining concessions signed between foreign mining companies and African governments. Often, mining companies have negotiated tax exemptions far above the provisions specified in the relevant mining code. Curtis et al. 2009. In a majority of these cases, departures of the signed agreement from countries' mining codes are not justified by profitability of mines. Rather, they result in the generation of additional economic rent for the mine operators. There are several explanations for this outcome. Many African countries offer highly generous concessions with the belief that such incentives are necessary to attract investments. The limited capacities of the relevant line ministries are ill-matched with the high capacity of mining companies during concession negotiations. Furthermore, there is often information asymmetry between public and private partners. This is partly due to the fact that in many cases the companies that have invested in mineral exploration are the same companies that receive the mining rights. In the absence of adequately equipped geological survey departments that can provide countries with objective and relevant geological information for effective negotiation of the mining agreements, the information asymmetry weighs against the government since the private investors know far more about the geological property involved. Sturmer, 2010 one country with a large number of problematic mining deals is the Democratic Republic of Congo. In 2007, the government formed a commission to review 61 mining deals signed by the state-owned Gekka Mines with foreign mining companies over the period 1996 and 2006. In its reports released in 2008, the Commission found none of the 61 contracts examined to be acceptable, recommending renegotiation of 39 contracts and cancellation of 22. One of the mining contracts recommended for cancellation involves a copper and silver mine owned by Anvil, which negotiated total exemption from royalties and corporate income tax for the 20-year life of the mine. IPIS 2008 Despite the Commission's work, unfair mining contracts still exist in the Democratic Republic of Congo. 
See Box 3. Another country that witnessed a large number of questionable concession agreements is Liberia. In 2006, the current government of Liberia initiated a review of the concession agreements signed in the country between 2003 and 2006. Of a total of 105 contracts reviewed, 36 were recommended for outright cancellation and 14 for renegotiation. Among the key evaluation criteria for canceling or renegotiation of contract was whether the Liberian government received a fair value in the signed contract. The contracts renegotiated included an iron ore concession agreement signed between the state and ArcelorMittal in 2005. The renegotiation, which had been carried out with international assistance, led to 30 improvements over the original contract, Call et al. 2009. Given the prevalence of unfair mining agreements, it is not surprising that the African region has witnessed a lot of contract renegotiations in the sector. Table 1 provides a sample of renegotiated mining transactions. 4. Reforms in the Gold Mining Industry 4.1 Early Reforms of the Mining Sector in Africa Beginning in the early 1980s, the major DFIs, principally the World Bank, spearheaded reforms in the mining sector as part of a much broader macroeconomic structural adjustment in Africa. The main motivation for reforming the mining sector was to reverse its dismal performance as evident in the region's small share of exploration capital relative to its mineral endowment. World Bank, 1992 The strategies promoted by the World Bank included privatization of state-owned mining companies, reforms of relevant laws, reforms of the relevant government agencies, and legalization of artisanal mining. In many African countries, large-scale mining had been monopolized by state-owned mining companies, for example, Ashanti gold fields in Ghana. Reforms in the mining sector have been credited with revitalizing the sector in many countries. McMahon 2011. However, the reforms have not been problem free. The World Bank's initial approach seemed premised on the view that foreign investment in the sector was sufficient to ensure the sector's contribution to economic development. Consequently, there was initially less emphasis on the fair distribution of economic rents or shoring up the required capacity of governments to improve their share of those rents, but more stress on reducing regulations. A case in point was the treatment of royalties. Without exception, the World Bank advised member countries in Africa to reduce them. World Bank 1992 this resulted in significant decline in revenues from mining operations even though the effect of royalties on non-marginal mines is small. Otto et al. 2006 It also advocated for earning based royalties rather than those based on value or units. Note Although it seems this recommendation was not widely implemented since virtually all royalties in Africa are value-based ad valorem rather than earning or profit-based and note as it is made clear later in the paper such an approach ignores the limited capacity of tax administrators in Africa the type of royalty used involves a trade-off between minimizing distortion in the level of production or the grade cutoff and ensuring that governments collect enough revenue. Box 2 Box 2 Mining Royalty A royalty is a levy on mineral production 
that is ubiquitously assessed on companies in the extractive sectors, especially mining. There are three main kinds. One, production unit royalty. Two, profit earning based royalty. And three, ad valorem sales royalty. All three kinds have their advantages and disadvantages. Production unit royalty. This royalty is assessed on the quantity, i.e. ounces or tons, of mineral produced. It ensures government revenues from the start of production. Its main virtue is its simplicity, which makes it easy to levy since the mineral production of a mine is observable to a large extent. No African country uses this kind of royalty for precious metals. The disadvantage is its rigidity in the sense that the rate is independent of mineral price, which can be a problem when prices fall significantly. It also counts as a cost of production and therefore has the potential to affect the cutoff grade of a mine. Whether the magnitude of this distortion matters in reality depends on the share of royalty and production cost. Profit earning based royalty. Profit based royalty is a rate assessed on the profit of the mine. The range of costs that are deductible for such a royalty is dictated by the mining code or mineral legislation in the relevant jurisdiction. The main advantage of this kind of royalty is that it does not induce distortions in the optimal level of production or cutoff grade. Its main disadvantage is that it demands a high level of tax administration capacity at the local or central government level. This is important because companies have the incentive to be extremely liberal in deducting expenses that may not be allowable under the relevant mining code. Unlike the other types of royalties, a government is unlikely to receive revenues until after a few years of production since it takes a while before cash flows become positive. This becomes highly problematic if the life of the mine is not too long meaning that there will be a very limited period of positive cash flows. This is risky for cash-strapped governments that have few sources of revenues. It is instructive that only South Africa employs this type of royalty in Africa. Ad valorem Sales Royalty This kind of royalty is assessed on sale of the mineral produced. It is also known as net smelter return since some minerals must be further processed and this processing cost is usually deducted before the royalty is assessed. This is the most common royalty used in Africa mainly because it is relatively easier to implement, an important factor for many developing countries with limited tax administrative capacities. Along with quality-based royalty, the flow of revenues to the government through an ad valorem royalty is relatively constant and ensures the flow of revenues at the start of production. This is important for commodity-dependent countries since it reduces the cyclical natures of mineral-based revenues. Its main disadvantage is that companies can mis-invoice the price of minerals to reduce their royalty liabilities, a common practice, Curtis et al. 2009. However, the scope for such practices is less than in circumstances when a royalty is profit or earning based. Most African countries use this form and the most common rate is 3% precious metal and the average is approximately 4%. Table 2. Since a royalty on production is something almost exclusive to the mineral sector, this raises the question of their existence in the first place. The main justification, Otto et al. 2006, World Bank 1992, is that the sector is different both in terms of the degree of economic rents it produces 
and also because the minerals being extracted and the land on which it is located are owned not by the company but by the state or the country. Another area that had not received much attention during the initial World Bank led reforms was environmental regulation of the sector as the World Bank at the time viewed those efforts to be highly localized and easily addressable as a bazaar and Butler 2003 during the reforms in Ghana for example environmental regulation for the mining sector was only codified in 1994 despite the fact that liberalization started a decade earlier at Palu and Parks 2007 certainly the reforms by the World Bank have transformed the mining sector in the region for examples most mining royalties are at levels suggested by the World Bank and state-owned gold mining firms are playing a smaller role table 2 4.2 overview of current mining codes mineral acts in Africa the mining code of a country contains the subset of laws that regulate exploration and production of minerals as with most investment laws the clauses in the mining codes specify rights and obligations of the private company applicable taxes freedom to repatriate funds access to foreign currency etc interest and obligations of the state it is therefore the most important document as far as mining investment is concerned table 2 provides a summary of the fiscal regimes in the mining codes of most gold producing countries in Africa most of these mining codes have been enacted within the past 10 to 15 years reflecting the recent implementation of the reforms mentioned in the previous section for example the high frequency of the 3 percent royalty rate for precious metals is a direct consequence of World Bank led reforms other significant consequences of reforms reflected in virtually all recent mining codes include the lack of any restriction on foreign currency flows and the repatriation of profits as well as the removal of custom duties on imported materials table 2 focuses on the major sources of revenues for government in the gold mining sector while governments do receive revenues through other instruments such as license fee and value-added tax VAT the principal sources of government revenues are royalties see box 2 for the various types of royalties dividends and corporate income taxes among these three royalties are often the most important in terms of bringing in the largest share of revenues from the taxation of the sector the average royalty rate on the continent is approximately 4% while the modal rate in 2010 is 3% with the exception of South Africa which recently imposed a profit-based royalty all other African countries utilized ad valorem royalty as of 2011 furthermore almost all royalty rates in Africa are fixed with only a few exceptions for example in 2010 Burkina Faso instituted an ad valorem royalty rate that is indexed to gold prices specifically the minimum royalty rate is 3% ad valorem which increases to 4% when gold prices are between US dollar 1000 an ounce and USD 1300 an ounce and further to 5% when prices go in excess of USD 1300 an ounce the average corporate income tax in Africa which applies to the mining sector is approximately 32% given the lengthy tax exemption period granted to numerous mining companies this is not a major source of revenue in most African countries finally most countries also require a free share in mining operations free carried interest the average for the minimum share is 11 percent with less variability across countries than either corporate income tax or royalty rates Five policy reforms for maximizing returns for countries despite the reforms that have taken place in most gold producing African countries there is still room for improvement 
This section focuses mainly on reforms that are likely to 1. Increase African countries' share of the resource rents from their gold mining sector and 2. Ensure that those resource revenues are properly spent. In the former case, we perform some empirical analysis to substantiate our recommendations. 5.1. Compliance with Mining Codes As discussed earlier, it is not uncommon for mining agreements in Africa to be formalized in ways where mining codes are not adhered to. Beyond their effect in reducing government share of revenues, such practices are problematic for other reasons. The drafting and implementation of mining codes are expensive. Lack of enforcement of enacted mining codes also encourages a culture of willful disregard of laws, with consequences far beyond the mining sector. Virtually all gold-producing countries in Africa possess mining codes that govern investment in the sector. The process of drafting a mining code and its eventual passage by legislative bodies usually takes several years since it entails a modification or an addition to the country's business legislations. In countries with participatory governments, the process may include not only legislators but also consultations with civil society groups and subnational level administrators. This process entails the use of lots of resources, some of which have been provided by donors or DFIs. Examples of regional African countries that have benefited from DFIs in reforming their mining codes are Burkina Faso, Central African Republic, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and Mali. The latest generation of mining codes in many African countries, Akabza and Butler 2003, World Bank 1992, was explicitly designed to ensure that the interests of foreign investors in the sector were taken into account. This means that there is little compelling reason why mining agreements between companies and regional countries should involve violations of the enacted mining codes. Any necessary policy reforms for ensuring fairer sharing of resource rent must start with the requirements that all mining agreements conform to the relevant mining codes in place. DFIs have a critical role to play in this regard. Numerous mining operations in Africa have been financed by DFIs through debt or equity financing. A standing requirement that all mining agreements conform to the mining codes of the relevant countries should be readily implementable. Such a requirement would provide an excellent demonstration of additionality, a concept used by some DFIs, including the AFDB, to denote the extra value they bring to transactions that cannot be provided by commercial banks. Moreover, such a requirement would ensure that DFI's participations in mining projects are in line with their development mandate. Given the capital-intensive nature of mining operations and their limited linkages, government revenues provide one of the few ways in which the sector can contribute to development as opposed to pure GDP growth. Box 3 Unfair Mining Agreements Many African governments have had to renegotiate mining agreements that had already been signed due to the realization that the initial deals are unfair to the country. Below is an example involving a gold mine in the Democratic Republic of Congo. After some legal dispute with the government, Banro took over 100% ownership in the Twangiza Mine in the Democratic Republic of Congo through its subsidiary Twangiza Mining Sarl. The mining license is valid for 30 years. The mine's life is expected to be 20 years and expected gold production is approximately 300,000 ounces per annum. The financial internal rate of return at the conservative gold price of US dollar 950 is 27% while the weighted average cost of capital is around 10%. The concession agreement gives Banro a 10-year tax holiday. 
This tax holiday is twice the length provided for in the mining code, five years. The concession specified a royalty rate of 1%, while the mining code at the time specified a rate of 4%. The construction and operation of the mine would result in the displacement of at least 10,000 individuals. Several artisanal miners will also be displaced. 5.2 The Case for Higher Royalty Rates in Africa The modal royalty rate for gold production in Africa is 3%. Table 2 For virtually all countries in the region, this rate is fixed and independent of the level of gold prices. Unfortunately, this fixed rate limits the ability of countries to take advantage of high rents produced by gold mines especially during periods of rising commodity prices. It is especially noteworthy that when the ubiquitous 3% royalty rate was set in most regional countries, gold prices at that time, from the late 1980s and the early 1990s, were significantly lower than over the past decade. Akabza and Butler, 2003 As a result, the benefits of higher gold prices are being foregone by revenue-constrained African countries. There is obviously a limit to how much royalty rates can be increased. Since an ad valorem royalty, the most common in Africa, is part of a firm's cost of production, increasingly higher royalty rates can potentially create distortions in the optimal level of production or the cut-off grade of mines. However, it is our contention that the level of royalties that are high enough to impact decisions on whether to invest in a particular mine or not, as well as significantly affecting the level of profitability of existing mines, is far above the prevailing royalty rates in Africa. First of all, small increases in royalty rates have limited impact on mines. Otto et al. 2006 estimated that the financial internal rate of return IRR, of a mining operation falls by only two percentage points when the royalty rate goes from 0% to 3% on a modal gold mine. Note, we replicated a similar finding on the financial model of an actual gold mining operation in Africa. End of note. In an industry where the IRR are well over the cost of capital, increasing the royalty rates up to 5% would not threaten commercial viability of projects. In fact, Ghana updated its mining code in 2010 where the royalty rate has been set to 5%. Note, in the country's 2006 Mineral Act, the royalty rate specified as a range 3% to 6%. However, all operating mine companies have been paying the low bound of 3%. End of note. To contribute to this ongoing debate, we use mine level data from several resource rich African countries over the period 2008 to 2010. This allows us to empirically analyze the effects of royalties on cost and profitability while controlling for some potentially confounding factors. We specifically cover 27 mines in Botswana, Burkina Faso, Ghana, Guinea, Mali, Niger, and South Africa. This analysis starts by examining the relationship between cost of royalty per ounce of gold produced and total production cost, figure 11. It tests the hypothesis that royalty represents a significant component of total production cost so that firms base their production decisions on it. However, figure 11 shows no evidence of a strong relationship between royalty level and total production cost. In fact, the slope of the line in figure 11 is not significantly different from zero. Furthermore, the slope does not become significant when country fixed effects year dummies and mine grade are controlled for. Unlike the royalty levels, other factors such as the mine grade, measured in grams per ton, account for a more significant part of production cost. 
This fact can be observed in figure 12, which shows a clear and significant relationship between mine grade and production cost. In other words, production cost is more affected by a geological variable than the royalty level, which is a policy variable. In fact, figure 13 shows that once one controls for mine grade, year and country effects, there is no relationship between royalty level and the cost of production. The ultimate test of the burden of royalties is their actual effect on profits of mines. To test this, we assess the effect of royalties on profits while controlling for other variables. We define profit as the difference between revenue and cost. Revenue denotes the product of prices, average for that particular year, and the quantity of gold produced. The variables we control for are location, year of production, and mine grade. The country fixed effects controls for all time invariance over the sample period. Country level variables that affect mining such as fiscal regimes, macroeconomic climate, state of the infrastructure, environmental, and labor regulations. The year dummies also capture changing commodity prices. As with production cost, figure 14 shows that there is no significant negative relationship between royalties and profit once grade, country, and year effects are controlled. The above results can partly be explained by the fact that royalties share of production cost in African gold mines is low. The average royalty share of production cost in our sample is 6.6% and the median is 7.8%. As a result, the level at which royalties, as a share of cost, begin to have a significant effect on mine profit is far above the prevailing average rate in Africa. Figure 15. The fact that royalties per unit of production have no significant effect on both production cost and profit is puzzling, given the earlier argument on the instrument's potential effect on investment. However, this puzzle can be partly explained by two facts. First, royalty share of production cost in African gold mines seems to be low. The average royalty share of production cost in our sample is 6.6% and the median is 7.8%. As a result, the level at which royalties, as a share of cost, begin to have a significant effect on mine profit is far above the prevailing average rate in Africa. Second, gold prices have risen by, on average, 5% in real times and 8% in nominal times per annum since 1990. Figure 4. So commodity price levels in the past few years are far above the level when decisions were made to fix the royalty rates of many African countries at around 3%. Given this significant gold price increase, it is not surprising that royalty rates have almost ceased to be significant burden for most gold mining operations. It is possible that royalties can be a significant part of production cost but fail to explain variations in profit if the royalty share of cost is similar across mines. Our analysis shows that this is not the case. Specifically, the variation in royalty share of cost is significant. Figure A1 and much higher than other variables such as revenue. An argument frequently put forward against raising ad valorem royalty rates is that such an increase is likely to increase the cutoff grade. Note: The cutoff grade is the minimum grade, grams per ton, of ore below which the mine cannot be commercially viable. It depends on price forecast and other macroeconomic variables that affect profitability. End of note. Of the mine, Otto et al. 2006. In other words, a marginal mine that would have been commercially viable may no longer be profitable if a hiking of the royalty rate causes the production cost to rise significantly. While this argument sounds plausible, 
we are not aware of any large-scale study that demonstrates its effect in practice. In any case, one implication of the claim is that on average, the cutoff grade of mines in high-royalty countries should be higher than that of mines in low-royalty countries. Implicit in this claim is the premise that royalty share of production cost is significant and high. First, we show that the average cutoff grade for gold mines in Africa falls somewhere in the middle of the distribution of cutoff grades for gold mines in other parts of the world, higher than in Asia and the Americas, but lower than the average in Australia, Canada, and Europe. See Figure 16. Second, Figure 17 shows no positive correlation between royalty rates and average cutoff grade. While the coefficient of the slope is negative, it is not significant. Note, we are aware that this is not a definitive study on this issue, given the fact that we have not controlled for the effect of all other relevant variables. However, it seems highly unlikely that the inclusion of other variables would change the slope of the line in figure 17 to such an extent that it becomes positive and significant. End of note. The apparent puzzle can partly be explained by the fact that royalties, as a percentage of cost, at least in Africa, may be significant but not to the extent that it can affect investment decision. Specifically, the mean royalty share of production cost in Africa is 6.6%, the median is 7.8%, and the full distribution is in figure A1 in the appendix. While the preceding analysis is not exhaustive, it shows that there is no obvious reason why royalty rates in Africa should be lower than their current levels as reflected in many unfair mining concessions. We also examine the issue of whether the taxation regime of African countries serves as hindrance to investment as far as global mining companies are concerned. To address this question, we examined survey data from the Fraser Institute that compiles annual survey of international mining companies about their perception of mineral-rich countries. One of those variables focuses on whether the taxation regimes in a country serve as deterrents to investment in their respective mining sectors. Figure 18 reveals that African countries, on average, perform quite well, especially relative to other developing regions. Specifically, the taxation regimes in Africa are not far out of the norm to warrant disregarding key provisions of mining codes during concession negotiations. Figure 18 further shows that, on average, about 3.4% of the firms would not invest in African countries due to their tax regimes. Only Australia and Canada perform better on this variable. To recap, the assessment tests 1. The extent to which gold producing African countries are able to capture windfall gains from gold price booms 2. Whether prevailing royalty rates are high enough to impact investment decisions the empirical evidence demonstrates the lack of compelling evidence to justify violations of mining codes that are commonly observed. Furthermore, it suggests that there is scope for increasing royalties that still allows mining companies to realize adequate returns on their investments. This is especially true in a period of high and rising gold prices. 5.3 environmental standards. The extraction of gold is environmentally hazardous at virtually all stages. The construction and exploitation usually involves the clearing of land given that most modern gold mines in Africa are open cast. In many countries this has led to significant deforestation, diversion of water streams and erosion. When the ore is extracted the process of separating gold from other materials involves significant use of highly hazardous chemicals, which can lead to harmful soil and groundwater contamination. The negative environmental impacts hardly stop with mine closure. 
Improper mine closure can lead to leakage of previously used toxic materials. In the absence of clear preservation of topsoil material, reclamation of the mine site to a state close to its original condition becomes impossible, which can lead to irreversible environmental degradation. Natcher et al. 2003 Reforms concerning the environmental effects of mining lag behind other reforms introduced in the sector. Campbell et al. 2003 As previously mentioned, most of the initial reforms were driven by the desire to make the sector attractive to foreign investors and were accompanied by broader reforms that reduced the size of the public sector in many countries. While the reforms largely succeeded in making the sector attractive to foreign investment in many countries, McMahon 2011, they simultaneously weakened the capacity of the state, which had consequences for effective regulation of mining. Needless to say, an extractive sector that is highly polluting and makes land unusable for agriculture, for example, is not consistent with sustainable development. While the current regulations in many regional countries address environmental concerns, especially in the more recent mining codes and mineral acts, some gaps remain for others. As development partners for regional countries, DFIs have important roles to play in promoting sustainable environmental policies. 1. Presently, DFIs ensure the implementation of strict standards only when they serve as co-financiers of mining operations. A needed step in the right direction is the harmonization of environmental impact assessment to make sure that it becomes standard in mining operations of all regional countries. This is particularly important because while most mining codes in Africa require environmental impact assessment before a mining license is issued, harmonization will ensure that uniform standards are applied even when DFIs do not serve as financiers. 2. The use of cyanide and other chemicals is ubiquitous in gold mining. Highly damaging environmental effects can result when cyanide enters the water stream through a rupture in the tailing dam of a mine. This can lead to devastating effects on the ecosystem by killing fish, contaminating the water, and any activity dependent on that particular water source. Fortunately, there are international best practices that seek to mitigate the environmental impact of this particular chemical. These practices are codified in the Cyanide Code, Box 4. Unfortunately, not all gold mining companies operating in Africa are compliant with this code. Just as the implementation of rigorous environmental standards is required for DFIs to fund mining operations, so should the adherence to the Cyanide Code as well. Box 4. Cyanide Code The International Cyanide Management Code for the Manufacture, Transport, and Use of Cyanide in the Production of Gold Cyanide Code is a voluntary program to ensure the existence of a minimum standard in the management of cyanide use in the gold mining industry. Specifically, the code demands that signatory companies safely manage cyanide in mine tailings by the use of an outside independent auditor to ensure full compliance with the code. The code was created under the guidance of the United Nations Environmental Program, UNEP, in 2000. The International Cyanide Management Institute is in charge of administering the code. There are currently 30 gold mining companies that are signatories to the code including several with operating mines in Africa such as Anglo Gold Ashanti, Goldfields LTD, I Am Gold, Kenross, and Newmont. It should be noted that companies do not automatically ensure compliance with the code by all their mining operations by signing. The nature of the current code allows companies to commit through individual mining operations. 5.5 5. 5. 
transparency in revenues and concession agreements, ensuring that the regional countries receive fair share of the mineral rents is a necessary but not sufficient requirement for the mining sector to contribute to sustainable development. The nature of the expenditures of revenues determines to which extent higher mineral revenues can contribute to development. A major problem in some resource rich countries is the lack of transparency both in how concession agreements or mining license are issued and how payments received by the government are spent. For example, Ghana granted 21 mining leases to companies between 1994 and 2007 without any ratification by the parliament as stipulated in the country's constitution, i.e. et al. 2011. While the preservation of investor confidentiality is important during negotiations, this needs to be balanced against the need for transparency to ensure that governments are held accountable. Mainly as a consequence of the mining concessions granted in secrecy, there is little transparency with regards to government revenue from the mining sector in many African countries. This lack of transparency hinders accountability which increases the likelihood of misallocating public funds. This issue has long-term development consequences, as discussed in Section 3. High governance countries with resource endowment, including gold producers, experience better economic performance than low governance resource endowed countries. We provide two policy recommendations that are geared toward improving transparency in the spending of resource revenues. 1. The Extractive Industries Transparency International EITI, is an initiative designed to bring transparency in the extractive sector. Box 5. While membership would not instantaneously turn a poor governance country to high transparency country, it has the potential to lay the foundation for future institutional improvement by improving the capacity of civil society groups to provide oversight over government's handling of resource revenues. EITI membership should be set as a precondition for Development Finance Institution DFI financing of any mining transactions in regional countries, especially those with low governance indicators, to increase the likelihood that resources are properly allocated. Since membership involves a long process, DFIs should engage resource-rich countries on this issue early to ensure that potentially good mining projects are not delayed or canceled. The African Development Bank AFDB is especially well positioned given its ongoing engagements with regional member countries through its public sector operations, e.g. policy reforms for various sectors. Box 5. The Extractive Industries Transparency International EITI is an initiative launched in 2002 to bring greater transparency in the payment of mineral revenues to governments. The main idea behind the initiative is that greater transparency would encourage development by properly aligning incentives for all relevant stakeholders in the relevant countries. The initiative hopes that this would be achieved by one serving as a public commitment device that induce countries to implement policies conducive for investment, two, encourage greater foreign investment by reducing political and reputational risk, and three, helping civil society to better hold the government accountable to the public. To become a candidate country, five requirements must be met. These requirements involve public commitment from the part of government to adhere to EITI principles, engagement of the civil society organizations, and publication 
of an implementable timetable for the full EITI requirements. EITI candidate countries July 2011 Burkina Faso Cameroon Chad Cote d'Ivoire Democratic Republic of Congo Gabon Ghana Madagascar Mali Mauritania Mozambique Republic of Congo Sierra Leone Tanzania Togo and Zambia Candidate countries have two and a half years to meet all EITI requirements. As of July 2011, 11 countries are considered compliant. Among these are five African countries, Central African Republic, Ghana, Liberia, Niger, and Nigeria. Equatorial Guyana and Sao Tome and Principe were once candidate countries but not anymore. 2. Another relevant initiative that contributes to transparency is the Open Budget Initiative OBI CBOT 6. Unlike the EITI, this initiative is not restricted to countries with extractive industries. The basic idea is that with timely availability of information on government revenues and expenditures citizens become empowered to hold governments accountable. This initiative is highly relevant for resource-rich and gold-producing countries since the resource rents of these countries tend to be overly concentrated, making them easier to divert. In addition to EITI compliance, OBI membership should be considered as a requirement for low governance regional countries for DFI financing of any gold mining and other extractive projects. Box 6 The Open Budget Initiative The Open Budget Initiative is an international project developed by the International Budget Partnership IBP formed in 1997. Its objective is to assess and compare the accessibility of citizens to relevant budget information. This initiative assesses the level of fiscal transparency in each country in comparison to best international practices, thereby enabling citizens to judge the way taxpayers' money is spent. From the government side, it highlights strengths and weaknesses of the budget process and encourages the adoption of transparent and accountable budget systems. In each participating country, a survey is undertaken every two years to issue the Open Budget Index OBI, in partnership with researchers from the civil society. This provides objective information to the government on their transparency relative to other countries. The first survey was carried out in 2006 and covered 85 countries, including 26 African countries. In the 2010 survey, the top five performing countries in terms of budget transparency in Africa are South Africa, Uganda, Ghana, Botswana, and Kenya. The five least performing countries are Sao Tome and Principe, Equatorial Guinea, Chad, Algeria, and Cameroon. Given the nascent of the above initiatives, it is a little too early to evaluate their impacts. In fact, there are African countries that are currently EITI compliant and are part of OBI, but still score low in governance indicators. The converse is also true. These initiatives are therefore a good first step that helps establish the rules of the game especially in low governance countries. It is worth pointing out that in order for citizens to provide actual oversight and accountability, there needs to be sufficient access to information and the means to engage public officials. Ghana provides a good case with respect to application of most of the aforementioned reforms. Box 7 
The Ghana Case Study Background Ghana is currently the second largest gold producer in Africa, averaging about 77 metric tons of gold per annum between 2005 and 2009. The value of the minerals exported in 2010 was US dollar 2.5 billion, accounting for 44% of the country's total exports. IMF 2011. Gold accounts for 95% of the country's mineral revenues, i.e. et al. 2011. Ghana is also an important exporter of other commodities such as coca and bauxite. It is expected to start exporting oil in 2011, which will account for approximately 13% of its GDP. While gold has always been important for Ghana, the performance of the sector has not always been impressive. The gold sector in the country was more abound in the 1980s due partly to the combination of stagnant gold prices and the dominance of the inefficient state-owned mining company. Reforms as part of the structural adjustment program, many of the country's institutions underwent reforms with guidance principally from the World Bank and the IMF. The World Bank particularly played key roles in reforming institutions directly connected with the mining sector. Given the fact that all operating mines in the country in 1980 were run by government-owned companies, policy reforms pushed by DFIs were geared toward making the sector more attractive for private investors. Some of the specific reforms included the streamlining of investment procedures, updating the mining code, turning loss-making state-owned mining companies into profit-making entities and strengthening capacity at the Mines Department and the Geological Survey Department, among others. For example, the government-owned Ashanti Goldfields, which was also the largest gold mining company in the country at the time, received approximately a large loan, U.S. dollar, 200 million in 1985 to enable it to return to profitability. The first reform of the mining code was effected in 1984 with further amendments in 1987. Among the key changes made to the mining code following the reforms are the legislation of small scale mining, the reduction and consolidation of the number of procedures for foreign investors and the removal of windfall profit tax. The income tax rate was reduced from 55% to 45% in 1986, Akabza and Butler, 2003. Further reforms in 1994 brought it lower again to 35%. The range of royalty rates was reduced from 3% to 12%, to 3% to 6%. The existing Code Minerals and Mining Act, also known as Act 703, was enacted in 2006. The Code, a minimum 10% free, carried interest for the government. It also sets an ad valorem royalty rate of 3% to 6%. It should be noted that an amendment to the law has set a new 5% royalty rate in 2010. It further lowered the corporate income tax rate to 25%. The Privatization of Goldfields The government of Ghana floated 25% of its shares in Ashanti Goldfields on the Ghana and London Stocks Exchanges in 1994. The company was listed in the New York Stock Exchange 1996. The company merged with Anglo Gold in 2004, resulting in a new company called Anglo Gold Ashanti, 
to become one of the largest gold mining companies in the world. In 2011, government sold some of its shares in the company to make up for some fiscal deficit. As of December 2010, the government of Ghana is the ninth largest shareholder of the company, holding approximately 3% of the shares. Table 3 Large-Scale Mines Currently Operating in Ghana The government of Ghana owned some free shares in most mines as allowed by the mining code. Mines Tarqua Owners Goldfield 71% I am Gold 19% Government of Ghana, 10%. Production in 2010 in kilograms, 20,432. Mine Ahafo, owner Numat Mining, 90%. Ghana, 10%. Production in 2010, 15,450. KG Mine Ubaasi Owner Anglo Gold Ashanti 100% Note Source Company's Annual Reports The government owns about 3% of the company End note Production KG in 2010 8,987 Mine Wasa Owner, Gold Star Resources, 90%. Government of Ghana, 10%. Production, 2010, 5,213 kg. Mines, Damang. Owners, Goldfields, 71.1%. I am Gold, 18.9%. Government of Ghana, 10%. Production in 2010, 5,880 kg. Mine, Udwa Priam, owner, Anglo Gold Ashanti. Production in 2010, 5,245 kg. Mine, Bogoso and Prestia, owners, Golden Star Resources, 90%, Government of Ghana, 10%. Production in 2010, 4,845 KG Mines Shirano Owners Kinross 90% Government of Ghana 10% Production In 2010 5,188 KG Existing challenges in the sector Statistics on the country's mining sector clearly shows that the reforms had some positive effect while gold production stagnated in the 1970s and 1980s, negative 1% average annual growth rate between 1971 and 1989, production has shown strong growth in the period following the reforms, average annual growth rate of 12% between 1990 and 2009. However, the sector still faces some challenges. The mining companies still do not make all payments. An EITI review found that all companies operating in the country paid only the minimum royalty of 3%, even though the mining code specifies a range of 3% to 6%. Another major problem in Ghana is misinvoicing, whereby mining companies report lower gold prices to the government than those on the market. This has led to lower royalty payments and lower income tax revenues to the government. Sturmer, 2010. And finally, not all the cost of the industry may have been internalized. About 2 million acres of rainforest has been cleared for mining. Currently, only about 12% of the country rainforest remains. At Palu and Parks, 2007. 6. Conclusion Most African countries are endowed with a variety of mineral resources. The rents from those natural resources have the potential to contribute to both economic growth and development. 
However, this potential is yet to be realized in many gold-producing or resource-rich African countries. This paper focuses on gold, an important mineral commodity produced by at least 34 African countries. Gold-producing countries, like resource-rich countries in general, show a great deal of heterogeneity in both economic growth and human development. In a period of rising gold prices, with concomitant increases in economic rents from sector, questions have arisen as to whether all citizens of gold-rich countries are benefiting from this boom. The findings of our analysis of the gold mining industry is consistent with the widely held belief that the industry's contribution to development is hindered, is hindered by both its enclave nature and the prevalence of unfair concession agreements signed between governments and foreign mining companies. The capital-intensive nature of mining suggests that limited linkages are likely to remain a fact of the industry. However, the variance in the performance of resource-rich countries, a category which includes many gold producers, is indicative of the fact that the so-called resource curse is not destiny. Specifically, there is ample scope for policymakers to address the prevalence of unfair mining agreements that lead to repatriation of most of the resource rent, leaving local economies carrying the burden of resource extraction while enjoying little of its benefits. We also assess whether the current royalty rates in Africa increase the cost of production to significantly affect the profitability of mines, or decrease the likelihood of investment in the industry. Our analysis shows that royalties as a share of production cost are small in Africa. Other factors, for example mine grade, have a much more significant effect on cost and profitability. The result of our analysis actually suggests that there is a case for increasing royalties above the current modal rate of 3% to enable countries to gain a higher share of the mineral revenues. Our paper identifies several policy reforms that development finance institutions are well placed to champion to ensure that revenues from the mining sector in general and in gold mining in particular contribute to sustainable development. First, all concession agreements need to conform to enacted mining codes or mineral acts. The adherence to the mining code is a necessary condition for countries to benefit from their resource endowments by ensuring that they receive a fair share of the mineral rents. We also identify a set of policy reforms that ensure that once fair shares of these rents are captured, they are directed toward development an important prerequisite to the successful implementation of these reforms is the presence of adequate capacity at the government level. This capacity building issue also deserves serious attention. End of WPS number 147 Gold Mining in Africa Maximizing Economic Returns for Countries Read by Exam Info.